Welcome everyone. My name is Timothy Patrick McCarthy and I'm the host and director of the ART of Human Rights, which is a new collaboration between the American Repertory Theater and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. This series is sponsored in part by Project Grant for Mass Humanities and it is meant to use the arts and the humanities to explore some of the most pressing human rights issues of our time with leading artists and activists and academics. I want to mention before we begin that the musical prelude, the music you were listening to uh, when you were coming in, uh, was, uh, were songs from the long black freedom struggle. And uh, we wanted to play those songs because of the importance of music to that struggle and to the civil rights movement in particular. The scholar Charles M. Payne has written, I once heard a journalist who had covered the movement remark that two decades after its height, the civil rights movement had inspired no great works of art, no great novels or films, no great plays. <laughs> he rather missed the point, Payne said. The movement was its own work of art. For this evening's conversation on art and history and politics, I am joined by four distinguished guests. To my far left is Professor Lonnie Guineer, the Bennett Bosky Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. To my immediate left is Robert Schenken, the Pulitzer Prize winning and Tony Award winning playwright of All the Way and its sequel, The Great Society. To my immediate right is Dr. Lisa Coleman, the Chief Diversity Officer and Special Assistant to the President here at Harvard University. And to her right is Dr. Professor Peniel E. Joseph, Professor of History and the Founding Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts University. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Welcome. Our topic tonight is all the way, question mark, the unfinished struggle for civil rights. I want to begin, Robert, with you and ask you to reflect with us out loud. That's the point of this. Uh, I know we're in trouble. If, if you could reflect a little bit about the journey that all the way has been for you. How did you come to be inspired to write all the way and now it's sequel to Great Society? What about the history of LBJ and the civil rights struggle do you think would make great theater? And is there something in particular about the stage that called you to create this art? I'll try to do this, this very uh, briefly. LBJ has been in my head for a long time. I grew up in the Hill Country in Austin. And um, he, uh, is, I, I tend to think in present tense, uh, such a, an extraordinary, uh, indeed, uh, Shakespearean kind of character. Bill Moyers once described him as the 11 most interesting people I ever met. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I don't think that's far from the mark. Um, so there was that. But, but really, it was the opportunity in, in this story, in, in, in all the way, this pivotal, critical year, 1964, um, to explore issues that have uh, fascinated me for some time, and that is uh, power and morality, um, politics and civil rights. Um, this is just an extraordinary, this, this year, the individuals all in, in involved here, uh, Bob Moses, Dr. King, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Hubert Humphrey, Senator Richard Russell, and of course LBJ, um, it's, it's really a, a hinge point in American history. Everything changes in this year, it is never the same. It is, it is hard to imagine another year um, in which the political parties uh, completely switch positions on a major issue. And it results, of course, in a major realignment of the political geographical landscape in the United States. And it gives a cycle which I would like to think that we are perhaps only just now uh, emerging out of. Um, so that's why. And what about the, the theater as a place to create this kind of history? Well, you know, I, unfortunately, um, politics and history get kind of a bad rap in, in this country. I think people tend to think of history as just one damn thing after another. <laughs> and, uh, and politics as a bunch of people yammering at each other on the television, and of course, um, neither is there critical. Uh, I, of the Faulkner School, that uh, history is not dead, it's not even past. Um, 
continues to live through us, it continues to affect us, and you ignore it at your own peril. And politics shapes everything. Politics has never mattered as much as it matters today. Um, theater, because it is immediate, because it is live, because it is so visceral, I think gives one an opportunity to really reveal how muscular, how bloody, how intense the political struggle actually was and is, the sausage making of politics. Uh, and in doing so, you know, it's not just a hell of a good story, but, but you hope to provoke in people uh, a desire to learn more about this. Uh, is this true? Did this really happen? Is this the way it happened? And to provoke them to undergo their own campaign, their own search for the truth and, and, and attempt to change society. Um, I don't think there is any more important uh, thing that the arts can achieve than to bring an audience really viscerally, intellectually, emotionally into an experience of, of their own culture, of their own society, and then hopefully send them out charged up to explore that and, and hopefully take action as a result of that personal exploration. Thank you. Now, Lonnie, Peniel, and Lisa, I wanted to ask you a, a question. The 1960s, of course, was a remarkable time. Lyndon Johnson was a remarkable man. Uh, and uh, the civil rights struggle was, of course, a remarkable movement. And yet, this moment and this man and this movement were also remarkably complex, as we see in all the way, and as we know from studying the things that we've studied. And yet, these complex, remarkable things also have a deep relevance and resonance in our own lives. In the last several years, we've been celebrating 50th anniversaries. It seems like every month there's another anniversary of like the March on Washington for Jobs for Freedom, the, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, John F. Kennedy's assassination, LBJ's elevation to the presidency, the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Mississippi Freedom Summer, and we will continue to have these anniversaries. And so Lonnie, beginning with you, and then moving to Camille and then Lisa, from the vantage point of history, but also amidst the fierce urgency of our present moment. How do each of you assess the meaning and significance of the civil rights struggle? How many words? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. It, Just as long as it's out loud. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this is a crossword puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> to think about the civil rights movement in contemporary terms because in, in many ways what we've done is to simply think about the civil rights movement as Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream. And he had a dream and he might have had some nightmares but he didn't share them with us and all of a sudden we, you know, we're now this uh, much better society because we have a black president and we have uh, people of color, not just black people, but Latinos and um, South, South uh, Americans, people from India, who are all now part of, of, of our society. But um, what I think is missing from our understanding of the civil rights movement and thinking about it in the context of current uh, challenges, we, we tend to think that the problem is simply individual rather than systemic. So we tend to think that if we could just convince uh, white people to like black people, that that would somehow solve the problem. Now, it certainly would be helpful <laughs> 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 To, to know that you have, you know, friends of all, um, all kinds, but and and I certainly, you know, encourage people to have good friends of a different race or sex or you know whatever the um, caricature may appear. But what we have failed to do in terms of the civil rights movement and in terms of our not just our interpretation of it, but in terms of the ways in which we are moving forward, is that this is a, a crisis that is about 
the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States, and when I say that, I mean the double entendre of the United States Constitution that was drafted in the 18th century by all white men, most of whom, or many of whom I should say, owned slaves. And at, at least if you think about the um, conservative Republicans who are on the Supreme Court, the way in which they are implementing the quote unquote Constitution of the United States is as if we should all follow whatever the rules were back in the 18th century when the people writing that Constitution owned slaves. So, so, so my point, I don't want to take up uh, too much time, but my point is that this is a, a problem that involves substance and systems, not simply individual prejudice or individual ignorance. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Oh, people can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, one, thanks for the invitation, and it's great to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I really, I'll start off with uh, how do we define civil rights by speaking? One, I'm a historian. I'm one of the people who Robert was talking about in terms of how people think history is just a bunch of data stuff, and I think you're right. Even my students sometimes think I'm just teaching them about a bunch of damn things that happened in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, when we think about the civil rights movement, though, the movement is actually a movement for radical democracy. And I think, you know, how do we define radical democracy? Uh, Ella Baker, who's the founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, who's a sharecropper turned civil rights activist, uh, they defined it in specific ways about poor black people being able to decide for themselves how they were going to live, right? Not just participate by voting in Mississippi, Alabama, but really by being architects of the democracy. Um, 50 years later, what has happened, what has transpired? I think the interesting thing about the legacy of the civil rights movement is just really how contested that legacy is. Because on one level, that legacy has been appropriated by political figures and elected officials, right? And certainly, that appropriation includes Barack Obama. I mean, I think um, uh, one of the interesting parts about being alive in 2014 is the way in which uh, the President of the United States is both an inside and outside figure. Many people think of him as a civil rights activist because when he ran in 2008, he said, hey, I was a community organizer. Uh, he talked about the Joshua generation. He talked about he had a deep understanding vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, you know, he said he read Taylor Branch, right, our friend Taylor Branch, and Parting the Waters. Uh, he said he understood the civil rights movement. His, his memoir talks about SNCC, talks about the civil rights activists and, and the, how he wanted to be an organizer. He was inspired to be an organizer. And I think that insider, outsider status <laughs> has been very confusing for both black people, uh, political progressives of all stripes, because the same person who's saying he really valorized Martin Luther King Jr., saying the fierce urgency of now. When people said, well, why are you running? You're only a state senator for two years. You've only been a US senator for less than three. Why are you running? He said in 2008, I'm running because of the fierce urgency of now. And that's what Dr. King was saying in 1967, 68, when people were saying, why are you speaking out against the Vietnam War? When Dr. King was saying that militarism, materialism, racism were the triple threats against humanity. Right? Now, at the same time that he said he was doing this and he, he was anti-war, um, as president, uh, there's been transformations. As a president, he's the leader of the nation state. So there's multiple wars that continue. Um, there's drone strikes and thousands of people being killed because of drone strikes. Uh, there's an inability to have uh, redistributive policies uh, except for health care, but certainly uh, nobody on Wall Street uh, got punitive action against them. Um, there was no bailout for homeowners, but there was bailout for, for Wall Street and for, for automakers. Um, yet at the same time, this is the same person who's saying he's got the mantle and he respects the mantle of the civil rights movement. So I think what we've lost is an understanding that the civil rights movement was not a popular movement. Even though, yes, it's a grassroots movement, but most people in the United States of America at least, and I'm just saying empirically, just data-wise, they were not in favor of civil rights. They weren't in favor of radical democracy. 
They were in favor of the status quo. You were on the cutting edge of social and political uh, uh, movements when you said you were for civil rights. Um, and 50 years later, what's happened, and I, I've gone to DC and looked at the King Memorial and it's beautiful and different stuff, but King, who now we've appropriated, was one of the biggest critics of American democracy and the nation state, right? Uh, King dies trying to do a poor people's campaign, right? So even though we have this polarity between Malcolm X and Dr. King, King is a huge critic. Ella Baker is a huge critic of American democracy and American you know, institutionalized racism. So I'll wrap up by saying, the interesting part of where we're at is that civil rights has become a bedtime story. You know, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr. and Barack Obama. So there's a there's you know people say Rosa sat um, so so Martin could uh, uh, walk so Barack could run so your children could fly right that was a little yeah. little ditty that people were saying in 2008 and that sounds great but it's not the truth <laughs> it sounds fantastic but it's not the truth and people don't want to hear the truth they want a bedtime story with the beginning middle and end and Barack Obama is a successful happy ending. So part of this is about the civil rights movement's legacy being this cultural appropriation instead of its real legacy of, of, of social and political struggle that continues. The movement doesn't die uh, uh, in the 1960s. It continues to this day, but it's how do we choose to remember this movement as Americans. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. So I'll pick up where um, Camille sort of left off, is that when we think about the civil rights movement, I think we have to think about civil rights movements, right? That this, these were a series of localized initially movements and actions coming together, galvanized, then to create a movement, as we might. And so those struggles were localized. And if we think about civil rights struggles even today, we've seen some of those localized struggles most recently in the cases of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Renisha McBride, et cetera. And so as we start to, as we think about the struggle, which is what is the meaning and urgency today, what comes to mind are the things that remain consistent in the systematic and systemic issues that we need to examine. Police brutality, banking, housing. Some of those, the, the same, similar issues, differently configured, as Lani has already referenced, in terms of the systemic and systematic nature in which they arise today. And so there are differences between civil rights struggles of yesterday and today. But yet what we know is that the systems of militarization, of the way that gets op adopted into police systems, into de so-called democratic practices, that's where we need to think about the urgency and re-examining the definition of civil rights today. And let me say this, when we think about the civil rights, and, and this was referenced earlier in terms of particularly African Americans, when we think about where African Americans are today, and I want to draw particular attention to some of the things that Peniel mentioned because of the people who were sort of left out of the movement, right? Left out in the reconstruction of the movement and that is the bedtime story. So the names that sort of get lost in that, and I think that's crucial because if you think of somebody like Claudette Colvin, who sits on the bus at 15 prior to Rosa Parks, that is an important story because it's a legacy, a story for our children about what it means to be an activist as a young person, to move into that world. And losing those stories loses a wealth of then what it means to struggle and continue that struggle in an everyday and ongoing manner. Thank you, thank you all. <clears throat> now we're gonna segue into a couple of clips from All The Way. Many of you, I'm sure, how many of you have seen the play here? David, okay, so a good, a good chunk of you. We've all seen it as well. But we're gonna show, <coughs> uh, we're gonna, you've seen it? <laughs> I hope so. You wrote it, I think, yeah. And we're gonna play two clips uh, from Act One. The first clip is a conversation, a, 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 a tense conversation between LBJ and Martin Luther King in the Oval Office. And the second clip is a heated conversation among uh, five uh, civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, Bob Moses, Stokely Carmyle, and Michael, and Roy Wilkins. And it ends with an encounter between LBJ and Hoover following that conversation. So we're going to roll both of those clips back to back and then react to them. Thank you. 
Uh, my people are deeply concerned, Mr. President. I understand. You promised the country a civil rights bill, and the voting rights component is critical. Absolutely critical. We're going to fix that, just not in this bill. Now, right now, we're going to take care of segregation in public accommodations first. Did you know that every year my cook, Zephyr Wright, best damn chicken fried steak you ever put in your mouth. <laughs> well, every year, she and her husband, they drive my Packard from Washington back down to the ranch for me. Uh -huh. Well, now, Zephyr is college educated and all, but she can't use any restrooms along any of those highways because they're all whites only. She got to squat in a field by the side of the road to pee like a dog. And that's just not right. And by God, we're going to fix that. The Civil Rights Bill of 1957 was supposed to fix that. Well, if you're going to quote my record, sir, you got to quote the whole thing. I'm a Roosevelt New Dealer at heart. As a matter of fact, John F. Kennedy was a little too conservative for my taste. <laughs> well, I don't need to tell you how significant the Negro vote was in President Kennedy's election. President Kennedy was always very appreciative of your vote. Well, he didn't have my vote. Georgia officials declared I hadn't lived long enough in Atlanta, and Alabama officials said it was too late to vote absentee. Uh, voting rights matter, Mr. President. Nothing will ever really change in this country until Negroes can vote. The next bill will be voting rights. You know, after President Kennedy's election, Eisenhower publicly declared that his party had taken the Negro vote for granted. And I would hate to see the Democratic Party make that same mistake. Well, if you think Barry Goldwater is a legitimate heir to Abraham Lincoln, you should vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> Civil rights isn't the only thing I'm interested in, Dr. King. We got people in this country living in unbelievable poverty. I know. I grew up like that in the hill country. Picking cotton on my hands and knees. Harnessed like a mule to a road plow. Living off the bitter charity of my neighbors. No silver spoon in my mouth like Bobby Kennedy. But I got a dream, you see. Where we change all that. We're going to declare a war on poverty, and by God, we're going to beat it. A war on poverty. That's right. Now, I got all kinds of federal programs in mind on health, education, literacy, jobs, you name it. We're going to change this country top to bottom. That sounds extraordinary. There you go. See, I would very enthusiastically support legislation to that effect. But right now, I need to be able to go back to my people and tell them that this president is committed to civil rights and that this bill even without voting rights, will still be a strong bill with no further changes. Now, if I can't do that, I will lose their faith. And in their despair, I don't know what will happen. Is that a threat? <laughs> Certainly not. Yeah, I don't want it in spontaneous demonstrations on the street any more than you do. But in order to avoid that kind of situation, I need to be able to deliver meaningful reform. Okay. Okay. Now here's what I need. The bill is stuck in Judge Smith's Rules Committee and I need at least eight votes. Walter, to pry it out. Five Republicans and three Democrats. Walter, give me a list of names. Now you get your people in each one of these districts, your ministers, your clergy, your union supporters, and what have you, to lobby these representatives to release that bill. Oh, now, lobbying is just like propositioning women, you know? I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> I knew this fella, boy, he was a real ladies' man. He got more pussy than you ever saw. I said to him, what is your secret? He said, well, I, I go into a bar and I ask each woman if she'd like to go out. I said, boy, you must have got slapped a lot. He said, oh, hell yeah. 
But I also got me. Yes. <laughs> now we on the knee. Hey, yes. You get this bill out of Judge Smith's committee. All right. All right. Can you tell us what um, meeting that was? Like what the date was? Uh, I can't give you an exact date because, of course, I, I, I don't mean the. Just the month. The we're year? in. Uh, we're very shortly after LBJ has become president, so we're probably uh, January.